this, and I am a student at the High School for Excellence and Innovation. And I'm Lydia Roca, Brian's teacher. <laughs> this year, EBC has been working with our class to help helping us make a documentary about police, sanctuary cities, and immigrant rights. We are learning how the NYPD are contributing to the problem. It is, it's a really important issue for me because my family are all immigrants, and we're afraid of the new policies about deportation. <coughs> Excuse me. Deportation. I'm recovering from the flu, I'm sorry. <laughs> As a teacher, EBC has really energized me and my teaching. It's helped me see how important it is not only to teach about social studies and civics, but to actually have the students practice it. To be civic journalists engaged in the urgent social justice issues of our communities. So through this project, they have interviewed several immigration rights attorneys and many activists. And it wasn't easy, but we even interviewed the police. And this morning, we showed our documentary at a citywide conference for teachers and principals. And we're not the we're not the only school that EBC works in. EBC works in over 25 high schools and middle schools and after school programs, reaching over 2,500 students citywide, teaching students how to use video as a tool for telling our own stories, asking tough questions, and having dialogue issues that are vital for our, our democracy. And I can think of no one more prominent as a fighter for democracy in the media than Amy Goodman. Amy is an award-winning investigative journalist, syndicated columnist, author, and executive producer, founder, and host of Democracy Now! The Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard honored Goodman with the 2014 I.F. Stone Award Medal, sorry, I.F. Stone Medal for Journalistic Independent, sorry, the, <laughs> my apologies. The Neiman Foundation for, for, the, for Journalism at Harvard honored Goodman with the 2014 I.F. Stone Medal for Journalistic Independence Lifetime Achievement Award. She's also the first journalist to receive the Right Livelihood Award, widely known as the Alternative Nobel Prize for developing an innovative model of truly independent glass, grassroots political journalism that brings to millions of people the alternative voices that are often excluded by the mainstream media. She is the first co-recipient of the Park Center for Independent Media's Izzy Award, named for the great muckraking journalist I.F. Stone. Goodman has won the George Polk Award, the, the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia Award, and the Robert F. Kennedy Prize for international reporting. She was also inducted into the Park Center I.F. Stone Hall of Fame. Goodman has co-authored six New York Times bestsellers. Her latest book, Democracy Now!, 20 Years Covering the Movements, Changing America, looks back on, on over two decades worth of Democracy Now! and the powerful movements and charismatic leaders who are reshaping our world. I myself am a devoted fan of Amy's, and I'm so incredibly honored to give her the EBC's 2017 Journalist of Conscience Award. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that great introduction and especially the film that we just saw. The emotional honesty of it, the bravery and the authenticity, um, the group endeavor that you all engaged in. Thank you for sharing your life. Um, and it's just a great honor to be here. And I don't want you to think this is like some kind of nepotistic award, Steve Goodman, Amy Goodman. I, my brother 
is named Steve Goodman, by the way. Um, I now consider Steve a soul brother because of all the work that you're doing that's come from this uh, 35 years of your dedication, but also just all of you and how important it is to go to where the science is. I think that's what you did. I was just blown away by this film and I look forward to seeing the next one. You know, I just came from a few hours ago, um, spending some time with the chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. His name is Chairman Dave Archambault. And I don't know how many of you have been following the standoff at Standing Rock, uh, but it is an epic struggle that Native Americans from Latin America to the United States to Canada have been gathering in North Dakota to fight for a sustainable economy and against what's called the Dakota Access Pipeline, this $3.8 billion project that rips up the land and goes from North Dakota to South Dakota through um, Indiana, Illinois, and then will hook up with a pipeline to the Gulf of Mexico. And Native Americans are saying no. The property stood in front of the bulldozers, incredibly brave, these massive machines that churn up the earth. And they actually succeeded in pushing these bulldozers back. It was at that point that the Dakota Access Pipeline guards unleashed dogs on the Native Americans. Dogs. They don't call themselves water, they don't call themselves pro protesters, they call themselves water protectors. And the dogs were biting them. And we filmed a dog with its mouth and nose dripping with Native American blood. We posted this video online that night. This is just last September. And within 24 hours, there were like 14 million views. I mean, this was in the middle of the, September, of the 2016 election, when the, I don't really call them journalists on television, the media personalities who were conducting these presidential debates, never asked one question about climate change. You know, the question of the fate of the planet. And here were all these young people and older people who were putting their bodies on the line at that time. We interviewed a Native American leader named Winona LaDuke who said to the governor of North Dakota, you are not George Wallace, this is not Alabama, this is not 1965, we are through. That was the day of the dogs. We came back to New York and continued doing Democracy Now! We invite you all to our studios at 25th and 7th. We broadcast every morning from 8 to 9. Anyone can come. Tomorrow we'll be talking to Chairman Dave Archambault because he happens to be in New York, the 45th chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Like President Trump is the 45th president of the United States, at least for now. Um, and, um, and later that week, when the governor called out the National Guard, it didn't look very good for the tribe, the authorities there also issued quietly an arrest warrant for me. I didn't know it at the time. The next day I went up to Canada for a film that was being premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival about I.F. Stone, the great muckraking journalist who said to young people, if you're gonna remember two words, remember governments lie. If you can remember three words, all governments lie. <laughs> and so it also sort of profiled Democracy Now! and Rolling Stone, Matt Taibbi, so he came up. And we gave a talk that night after the film, and I was talking about just having been in North Dakota. And the next day, we were at University of Toronto speaking to a crowd like this. And in the middle of my talk, I got a text, I hope I don't get a similar one right now, that said, you're under arrest. It, it said, there's an arrest warrant for you. And I was pretty shocked. I thought it was like a scam or something. So that just don't check your phone in the middle of a talk. But I saw it was a North Dakota number, and it was looking like this, going, oh man. And um, I thought, okay, arrest warrant is serious, as um, a number of you might know. Uh, it didn't mean I was gonna be picked up right away, um, but if I had some encounter
encountered with the police or the FBI or border guards, and I had to go back over the border to come home, then if it was in the system, I would be taken. So I just looked out at the audience in the middle of my talk. I said, could someone call me a cab, please? <laughs> and I raced to the airport, and I did get back into New York. But I didn't take this arrest warrant personally. I really thought it was a message to all journalists around the country, do not come to North Dakota, which is exactly why we had to head back to North Dakota. And all journalists should be there. And I particularly thought about young journalists and how we have to do this for you. We have to fight back. Because if you want to go to cover something like this, whether it's encounters with police in the street or in North Dakota, this epic struggle of Native Americans, you can't afford to go to jail. You don't have the institutional backing. You don't have the support. And we have to prove to you that this is America where you shouldn't have to get a record when you put things on the record. So we headed back to North Dakota in October. And as we landed, the authorities announced they would drop the charges against me, just what we thought. But then they announced that they were going to bring more serious charges against me of riot. What, like I'm a one woman riot? What were they talking about? This was just outright harassment. And they said I'd be arraigned three days later on Monday at 1.30. This was Friday afternoon. So I said, perfect, this gives us two more days to cover the protests. And you should see these protests. I mean, you've seen similar ones, I'm sure, if you watch the protests in Ferguson. Fully militarized police taking on nonviolent protesters, or even here in the streets of um, New York. In North Dakota, it's the back roads and it's families that are walking and saying no to a fossil fuel economy and actually offering water to the RoboCop Police, truly, they have military weapons. They've got MRAPs, they've got tanks, they've got automatic weapons. This is what we call recycling in America today, where you take the weapons from Afghanistan and Iraq and give them to the police departments of this country. And so we filmed all of this, just like we filmed the dogs. And on Monday, we had to do our show. The show must go on. 8 o'clock in the morning, 7 North Dakota time. We thought, where are we going to do it? We got a broadcast truck from Minneapolis. It came up. And so we did it in front of the courthouse and jail in Mandan, North Dakota, where I'd have to turn myself in right afterwards. <laughs> and so we broadcast the courthouse, the jail, and the Ten Commandments in between. Um, and we interviewed the chairman of the tribe, Dave Archambault. I asked him if he'd ever gotten arrested. He said, yep, protesting the pipeline low-level misdemeanor. I said, so what happened? He said, oh, I got strip searched, put in an orange jumpsuit, and I was jailed. The pediatrician of the tribe, Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle, strip searched, put in an orange jumpsuit, and put in jail. I mean, how much humiliation can a people take? And they're jailed in the town where the people had said no to the pipeline, and so the company said, then we won't put it here. Just like in the capital of North Dakota, in Bismarck, they said no to the pipeline, and so they didn't put it there. The Native Americans said, just treat us like other North Dakotans. But they weren't so lucky. Um, as the show ended, uh, the hundreds of Native Americans came to show support. All the media was covering this because a journalist was getting arraigned. The New York Times, the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, even Vogue magazine was there. <laughs> I should only learn to dress like you do. <laughs> and so, um, and ultimately, right before the arraignment, I got a call from North Dakota Public Radio, and they said the judge is not going to bring the charges against you. I mean, the media attention was intense. And you know what else? The Native Americans who were being arraigned that day on felony and misdemeanor charges, a number of them had their charges dropped. This is what happens when you shine a spotlight, the media spotlight, in the right direction. The media can be the greatest shield, and that's what we have to remember. We have a decision to make. 
whether we want to represent the shield or the sword. And I think it's clear what all of you feel about the media, that this can be the greatest protection, and I hope you continue it in your life. I'll just end by saying, you know, oh, technology is so sophisticated these days. We have high-tech television, high-def television, and digital radio, but still, all we get is static. That veil of distortion and lies and misrepresentations and half-truths. When what we need the media to give us is the dictionary definition of static, criticism, opposition, unwanted interference, we need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. And we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. Democracy now.